Direct Connection is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Live from Maryland Public Television, this is Direct Connection with Jeff Salkin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for Direct Connection. Coming up in our Your Health segment, pioneering work to improve stroke treatment. First tonight, political leaders are looking for solutions to the heroin overdose crisis. What do medical experts think could help? Joining us tonight is Dr. Lena Wen, the Baltimore City Health Commissioner. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me here. We've seen these incredible numbers that statewide in Maryland, the number of deaths related to heroin have doubled in a relatively short period, a few years. W what do you see in Baltimore City? Mm. Baltimore City has been hit hard by the heroin epidemic for many years. It's been a problem that we've been facing, and we've been using public health approaches to fight this problem. We know that addiction is a chronic disease, so we have to treat it through prevention, but also recognizing that it's a chronic disease, we have to treat it in a number of ways, not just using medications, which is really important, but also focusing on mental health counseling and on preventing people from dying from this problem. Has, has the entry point to heroin addiction changed for, for, for some people. I um, used to think of it as a, a sequence from, from uh, certain drugs to entry, gateway drugs to so, stronger drugs, and ultimately becoming a, a heroin addict or, or meth or something. But what you hear now is that people are prescribed opioids for pain for various uh, medical conditions, and, and that leads them down to the path to heroin. Numerous studies have shown that many people are becoming addicted to heroin first through using these prescription medications. And it's astounding the multiple millions of prescriptions that we have every year for things like Percocet, Oxycodone, Oxycontin, morphine that are not needed. Every year in the U.S., about 260 million prescriptions for opiate medications are given. That's one for every adult American, which is an astounding number of medications. And I ask, are Americans really in that much pain, or are we overprescribing opiate medications? So what have you've worked as an emergency room uh, physician? Are, are doctors doing something different? And, and certainly dentists can also prescribe this stuff. Um, is, it, is it being given out too liberally, and, and, and why? It's a combination of problems. Some of it has to do with marketing that drug companies have put forth, saying that every pain needs to be treated with a medication that's not just Tylenol or rest, but a strong medication. Part of it is the education of doctors. I know that in my own medical training that we never learned about the harms of these medications. We only learned that if this is what patients want and this is the standard of care, then we give it. Part of it is also expectation by patients as well. And so we really need to educate people and educate our community on the dangers of opioid medications and heroin as well and how prescription drugs could be a gateway to heroin. I'm sure a lot of people uh, watching us tonight have been prescribed one of these medications at some point, what makes one person more susceptible than another to, to becoming hooked on it? These are highly addictive medications. Some people are more likely, just based on their biology, to become addicted, but I'll emphasize that these are some of the most addictive substances in the world. And we also know that these are highly dangerous substances, too. You were talking about overdose deaths in the beginning. In Baltimore City, we have more people dying of drug and alcohol overdoses every year than we have dying of homicide. And it's an issue that we can all do something about because these are preventable deaths. There's one medication called naloxone or Narcan that can completely reverse the effects of heroin or, op or other opioids. It's safe, it's effective. I used it dozens of times. And we have to make sure that everyone gets access to this medication to save their lives. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about the uh, outbreak of, of heroin deaths or related questions, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You could also tweet a question. Our Twitter address is at MPT News. So the, the medication um, that uh, it's almost an antidote 
for for heroin or an opioid overdose isn't new. It's been out for decades and decades. Why, why so much attention on it right now? This medication called naloxone is completely safe. It's on the World Health Organization's list of essential medications. The reason why we're talking about it so much now is we have the opportunity to train everyone to be able to use this medication safely. We give an epinephrine pen to people who are dying from anaphylaxis, right, from a peanut allergy or something else. That's even more dangerous, potentially, than, than this medication, Narcan. It's so easy to use, and I'm happy to demonstrate the use, actually, Absolutely. if you would like. And, and so. you showed me before. I, I was thinking uh, EpiPen injector, mm -hmm. but this is not an injection. There are two types of, um, of ways to administer this medication. One is through an injection, and the other is actually through the nose. So for some people who are scared of, of needles, this is another way to do it. There are three components. Probably there aren't that many heroin addicts who are scared of needles, but the person the family administering, and friends. right. Exactly, so there are three components of it, and what I would say to people who are using it for the first time, there are three very easy steps. The first step is anything that's brightly colored, first take it off, so take off all the caps that are brightly colored, step number one. Step number two is assemble the three pieces. So this is the syringe part, this is the medication. You screw this in and you screw the top in. This part is called the atomizer, which delivers the medication into someone's nose. Step number three is you simply press this and the medication comes out as a mist. When would it be appropriate for somebody to administer that? If you know that somebody is uh, a heroin addict, if you know that someone uses heroin and uses prescription medications and they're unresponsive, the most likely reason for them being unresponsive is that they're not breathing from an overdose of this medication. So there is no harm at all to using this medication if someone isn't actually addicted to heroin. So I give Good, it to my family or you. I was watching the spray and <laughs> wondering about that. Let's take a phone call. I want to come back to that. Uh, Baltimore City, this is David. David, thank you for the phone call. Go ahead. Yes, uh, up until uh, the early, sometime in the early 1900s, uh, these drugs were, uh, especially opiate drugs, were legal. Um, I'm not sure what drugs should be uh, considered uh, uh, to possibly be made legal, but wouldn't the government uh, being able to regulate these drugs, their distribution, wouldn't that uh, solve a lot of problems about uh, uh, emergency medical uh, uh, um, needs, uh, the control of crime? David, thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. I appreciate the phone call. Based on your experience as an emergency room physician and, and a new uh, public health commissioner, thoughts on that, legalization of drugs, especially while down the road in Washington, we're, we're seeing marijuana legalized at the moment. Well, heroin is not a legal medication. It is illegal. We also know, though, that prescription medications like oxycodone, Percocet, the other medications that we mentioned that are opioids, they are legal. And the issue is that they are prescribed in such large numbers that that is causing people to become addicted and then later on potentially switching to heroin. So the way to fight heroin and opioid abuse is a combination of approaches, and part of it needs to be through the criminal justice system and stopping the importation of heroin and other illegal medications. But we also have to address it through a public health approach as well, when that includes preventing overdose deaths, and it includes also making sure that people have full access to treatment, including mental health treatment. Um, let's talk about two aspects of that. Uh, one is needle exchange programs that Baltimore City has, has long had, and the other, methadone clinics. Maybe start there for a moment, and, and the um, importance of that and, and how it actually, in your view, fits into the solution. Heroin is such an addictive drug, and uh, fighting abuse and fighting addiction, we have to recognize that addiction is a chronic disease, just like diabetes or high blood pressure. So about diabetes and high blood pressure, we recognize that you need a number of things to fight it. You need a number of medications. You also need ongoing lifestyle change and counseling and lifestyle factors and many other things. Same thing with chronic drug addiction as well. So we need methadone, buprenorphine, medication-assisted treatment, and we need a combination of counseling and other things in order to help um, and really fight the problem of addiction. 
Uh, let's take another phone call. This is Lisa in Montgomery County. There you are. Lisa, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Hi. I'm calling to ask, uh, that's my bird in the background saying hello. Um, okay. I'm calling to ask about how a parent or family member can be trained and ha have, a, I guess, a permit to have the naloxone at home. What, what makes you ask if I can inquire? Um, actually, I, I have a, it sounds funny, I have a friend whose uh, son uh, uses um, uh, heroin. My, okay. Thank you for the phone call. That's such a terrific question, Lisa. I'm so glad that you asked it because for the last, since last year, we've been able to, through the health department and through Behavioral Health Systems Baltimore, we've been able to train third parties, meaning family and friends and anyone in the community, to be able to carry and to be able to use naloxone. We know that it's a life-saving medication. It's easy to use. It's totally safe. And so I recommend for everyone to go through the training, then you'll carry a certificate and you'll also be able to get this medication you can keep it in your medicine cabinet, you can keep it with you, and you'll literally be able to save a life every single day. We offer these trainings on a monthly basis. You can find out more at the Behavioral Health Systems Baltimore webpage or also through um, our Baltimore Health Department web webpage as well. And we encourage everyone to learn how to save someone else's lives. A couple minutes we have left. Um, let's talk broadly about your agenda as the new health commissioner for Baltimore City, just uh, five or six weeks on the job. I know root causes of substance abuse are something you want to look at. Um, what, what else is of interest? Substance abuse is so closely tied to everything in our city, and so certainly addressing that will also allow us to address issues like poverty and health disparities more broadly. Another issue that I'm focused on is youth wellness, understanding that the youth of our city are so critical to the future of our city and our community. And that's the same not only for Baltimore, but for every city, every jurisdiction across the country. So looking at physical health, but also looking at mental health and developing a comprehensive youth wellness campaign. The third issue is caring for the most vulnerable. This is the reason why I went into emergency medicine, because I wanted to care for those who are the most at risk and finding ways to care for our elderly, to care for our children, to care for the uninsured. Those are things that I want to focus on so that we can make Baltimore healthy and well. Let's get one last phone call. Baltimore City, this is Bill. Bill, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, this is Bill. I had a comment and a question. I yes, personally sir. was. Um, a heroin addict for six years. I never had any legal problem. I did want to get help. I knew I wanted to stop. I tried to uh, use my employee assistance program and other private organizations. And quite frankly, I was sent out the door on all occasions because it was, I did not have a court order. Uh, they did not know what to do with me. And that's pretty much the sum of it. If you want to get help, you can't you there's nobody knows how to help you you can only get help if you're ordered to do it and i wonder if there's anything that's going to be done about that bill before Thanks. you go you you stayed employed while while you were uh while you were hooked uh yeah i never had any legal problems whatsoever i never lost a job okay can i ask how how you got introduced to it in the first place um, I would say it was at a period of my life that was very negative, and the people I were around uh, were PhDs and were using it, and for, uh, it was a bad decision at one point. Yeah. How, how long have you been clean for? Uh, four years. Well, congratulations. Let me get Thanks. to Dr. Wen's comments. Good luck to you. Thank you. I appreciate thought, it. Thoughts? Bill, thank you for sharing your story. And it's such a poignant reminder that any of us could be at risk for being addicted to heroin and to opioids. And I've seen in my patient population people who you would never think are stereotypically the ones to use heroin. And many times family and friends don't even know about it. And so it really is our neighbors. It really is our friends. It really is everyone around us. It's so critical, though. That's why it's so critical for us to make sure that we have treatment on demand. Somebody should not have to wait months to get into a treatment program. We should have treatment options available when someone decides that they want to 
equipped. And we have to make sure that everyone is trained to save our own, our friends and our, our community's lives. Because as you heard from Bill, it's not necessarily someone who's out of work or whatever stereotypes may be. It really could be the person next to you who may be addicted to drugs. I do worry a little bit that, that um, somebody is going to need Percocet for something and, and they're going to be so scared of it. What, what's the solution there? You know, if somebody's had uh, surgery or whatever the problem is, uh, I mean, should, should the stuff be banned? People should be scared of taking these medications. Any medication that has the side effect of causing death, if you take too much of it, and causing a lifetime of addiction, I think people should be scared of it. We should be talking about the side effects of these medications a lot more. And only giving it for acute pain or very carefully managed chronic pain. So many times people go to the dentist and get a 30-day prescription for Percocet. You don't need 30 days of Percocet for dental pain that should be cured within two or three days. And so we have to be a lot more careful about prescribing it, but also a lot better about giving out naloxone. Anybody who gets a pain medication should, that could cause death should also get the reversal agent that could save their lives. Dr. Lena Wen is the new health commissioner for Baltimore City. Delighted you could come by. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And still ahead tonight, advances in stroke treatment. We'll be right back. Tonight on MPT. It's the concert that started it all. The three tenors. Conducted by Zubin Mehta, it's a classic performance that began a worldwide sensation. Carreras Domingo Pavarotti in concert. Tonight at 8 on MPT. He's one of television's most unique crime solvers. If you feel someone's soul is in danger, it's like the clouds go black, you know. Now the cast and crew take you behind the scenes of Father Brown. I just see them twittering away in the corner like little birds. Some directors find it a little bit of a trial. Action! How this popular mystery series comes to life. <laughs> on Father Brown, saving souls, solving crimes. Tonight at 10 on MPT. Can you imagine us? We're all so excited seeing the Statue of Liberty. And the parents said, you have to go to America because there's no future for you here. And so they came, millions of Jews, and brought with them incredible personal stories. Don't miss the upcoming special, The Jewish Journey, America. Tuesday night at 8 on MPT. In this week's Your Health segment, Dr. Timothy Miller, Assistant Professor of Diagnostic Radiology and Nuclear Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Interventional Neuroradiologist at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Talking about stroke treatment, two different types of strokes. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. Absolutely. So the, the most common type of stroke, the one that we're primarily focused on, is ischemic stroke. That's where one of the blood vessels that supplies blood to the brain becomes blocked. Uh, unfortunately, the damage to the brain can begin almost immediately within minutes. Uh, so really with this type of stroke, time is really brain. Um, it's critical that patients and families can recognize a stroke when it's happening. Uh, typical symptoms include weakness on one side of the body, difficulty to, difficulty to speak, sometimes facial drooping, and uh, seeing a healthcare provider or an emergency department really is key to try and improve patient outcomes. So, so when you say time is brain, and the mechanics of this sound a lot like a cardiologist talking about a heart attack, a blocked blood vessel in the heart, and time is muscle, they say. Absolutely. And, and with the brain, it's even more so. Uh, neurons will begin to die within maybe five minutes if they're uh, deprived of oxygen and blood flow. Now, it, it can vary in terms of where the side of the blockage is and also how the other blood vessels in the brain are formed. We're all different in that regard. And so for some patients, the maximal damage will unfortunately occur very quickly, and probably there's not much we can necessarily do to limit that damage in terms of opening the, opening the blood vessel. But for other patients, there's detour blood vessels that can sort of get around the blockage and keep some, if not most, of the territory alive for a longer period of time. And it's those patients that we're really gonna to try to focus on helping. So 
I imagine there's there's some um, pretty good recognition of what to do when somebody is having an obvious stroke. They have uh, paralysis on one side, as you said, difficulty speaking. You you call 911. You don't mess around with that. What what happens when somebody gets into the healthcare system, and how are you working to change that? So abs absolutely. So the first thing is to try to assess the patient with something called the uh, NIH stroke scale, which is simply is a shorthand, very quick and very standardized way to measure how severe the stroke might be based on the symptoms. So symptoms are cure points. The higher the, the score, the more severe the stroke might be. Uh, once that's done, again, that happens very quickly, often a CAT scan or CT scan of the brain is performed uh, to differentiate the ischemic stroke, the blood vessel blockage that we're talking about, versus the less common type of bloody or hemorrhagic stroke where the treatments are very different. So in, in terms of the blockage, typically a clot-busting medication might be administered. Absolutely. So for a, a very long period of time, stroke therapy really centered around supportive care, not necessarily, necessarily trying to open the block vessel, but trying to limit the damage the block vessel was doing. Uh, now, back in 1996, the FDA approved this IV uh, TPA drug, clot-busting drug, that can be given if the patient presents within a certain time frame after the stroke onset. Typically, three hours, in certain cases, maybe four and a half hours. Uh, the reason why that window is there is that essentially the benefits of the clot busting drug begin to go down as time progresses, and the potential risk of the drug begin to, begin to go up, namely bleeding into the area of damage of the stroke. So, what, what we're talking about now and what you do as an interventional neuroradiologist right. is it sounds a little bit similar to what an interventional cardiologist does in terms of threading a catheter up there to, to go get the clot. That's absolutely right. So, for the large vessel strokes, where the blockage is at the base of the brain involving one of the largest blood, blood vessels, although they're less common, they, they tend to be more severe, there's more brain at risk. Uh, that, that's the thought. The clot busting drug is the least effective for that type of blockage. Uh, so patients either aren't candidates for the clot busting drug because they have a contraindication like a recent surgery, or the clot busting drug isn't effective. We can go just exactly as you said, take a catheter and small wire under x-ray guidance up to the side of blockage, and then try to open the vessel from within the artery. So that was first tried using with the clot busting drug again, placed directly into the clot. And although that was effective, we really, in the last decade or so, have moved on to mechanical devices. The first one looked a lot like a sort of a corkscrew. It would simply be placed in the clot, and once it engaged the clot, you would simply try to retract the wire and pull the clot out with it. More recently now, what we have is almost what looks like a blood vessel stent, but attached firmly to a wire. So the stent's deployed within the clot, and it can actually reopen the clot almost immediately in a lot of cases. And then after waiting a few minutes, you simply retract the wire back, and if things go according to plan, the clot should come out with that stent on a wire. You make this sound very simple. <laughs> In a lot of ways, it, it comes down to what we do mostly is if a normal blood vessel is blocked, like when an acute stroke, we try to open it. In the case of other problems in the brain, like a cerebral aneurysm, an abnormal blood vessel, we try to close it down. Uh, there's obviously a lot of technical details, but essentially that's what we do. What, what are the prospects for um, stroke therapy, emergency treatment, evolving in, in this direction? A, a little community hospital on a Sunday morning is going to have a hard time doing this. Uh, that, that is yeah. true. Really, you, you want to look at centers that uh, specialize in stroke care, have high stroke volumes, and are, are used to, essentially, it, it really comes down to a team approach. You need everyone on board in terms of trying to move the patient through these steps, initial evaluation, initial imaging, uh, evaluation of the clot busting drug, and if it's not effective and a large vessel is blocked, getting quickly to the angio suite so we can try the interarterial therapy. Um, and it takes a lot of different uh, parts of the team to do that effectively and a lot of experience as well. It, m it must be especially rewarding when you can solve the problem retract it, and, and there it is. Well, you know, uh, a lot of uh, individuals in this uh, business, including interventionalists and stroke neurologists, have talked about a so-called Lazarus effect. Someone gets on the table, they're not moving one side, they're not speaking, and shortly after the clot's removed, uh, they start to regain that function. And I, I wish that happened in all cases. That's not necessarily true, but when it does occur, 
uh, it really makes a very strong impression on all of us. I bet. Dr. Timothy Miller of the University of Maryland, thank you for coming by. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us for Direct Connection coming up Thursday at this time on Your Money and Business. More expansion plans for the state's largest airline. We'll hear from the CEO of Southwest. Now, for all of us here at MPT, I'm Jeff Salkin. Thanks for watching Direct Connection and have a good night. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities.